Good morning to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us today for the last webinar of the UNIMED uh, week in Brussels in an online, again, online edition. Um, we started the first day of the, uh, of the UNIMED week this year. We started with a discussion with the, the uh, European External Action Service. And uh, we, had, we had with us Mr. Hallegard, that in a way gave us um, the, po the policy uh, vision of the new agenda for Southern Mediterranean cooperation with the European Union. Today we conclude with uh, the DGNIA, which is the DG dedicated director general uh, dedicated to the neighborhood policy for the cooperation with Southern Mediterranean and obviously uh, the other neighborhood. But in particular, for our case, for Southern Mediterranean, to go more in detail about this new agenda, to have some concrete example about the cooperation of the European Commission is planning with Southern Mediterranean. I'm very pleased to have with us two uh, important speakers from uh, European Commission, and we will start first with uh, Jean Marie Moreau. Uh, <coughs> In charge, of the, which is uh, uh, which was in a few few weeks ago in the European delegation, the European Commission delegation in Egypt, that will present us the first uh, example of this uh, cooperation of the DG here. Please, Jean Marie, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Marcelo. Good morning, everybody. I am very pleased to be uh, with you today. My name is uh, Jean Marie Moreau. I am an official of the Commission. Uh, I am working in Digineer. It's not B3, it's a mistake, it's a T4 here. It's uh, Digineer B2, which is in fact, uh, in, in fact in charge of the uh, regional, uh, regional uh, programs for self-neighborhood. I have joined uh, this uh, unit uh, only one month ago, and I was before indeed uh, uh, four years posted as uh, head of human and social development section in the delegation in Cairo. Uh, my intention today is to drive you very briefly uh, on the priorities in the field of education uh, as set in our uh, agenda for the years to come. You know that uh, we have uh, a multi-annual uh, financial framework, uh, which is established for seven years, 2021-2027. Uh, so uh, I want, as I was saying, to drive you a bit on uh, what, uh, why education is highlighted. Uh, obviously highlighted in, uh, as among the priorities uh, for uh, our partnership uh, with the uh, South uh, neighborhood. Then I would wish to give you some uh, concrete examples of action points, which means uh, programs which could be developed uh, in the uh, years to come. And then uh, since I was post in Cairo, I thought that maybe you wanted to have a brief feedback on what we were doing, what we are doing there, in the field of education, uh, where we are very active uh, through Erasmus Plus, but we are active as well in uh, TVET and we are active as well in basic education, education with a very much focus on uh, social inclusion. So the first slide that you see here, um, sorry, if you can go back uh, to the slide before, yes, thank you so much. The, 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 the first slide that you see here is that uh, in February 2021, we have established a joint communication <coughs> with external service for a renewed partnership uh, with a surf neighborhood. And we have set, in fact, five uh, key um, priorities. Uh, human development, uh, uh, which includes obviously uh, uh, on, on power, empowerment of uh, youth and ed education. Uh, uh, resilience, um, uh, building prosperity and digital transition as a second priority, peace and security as a third priority, um, migration and mobility as a fourth, and green transition as the fifth. Now we can go to the next uh, slide, uh, please. And so the first objective, as I was saying, is human development, uh, good governance and the rule of law. And uh, that covers many topics, but the topic which is of interest for uh, our discussion today is education and youth empowerment. I think we can go to the next uh, slide, please. So uh, we want to, to invest in young people and children uh, so as they are uh, really targeted uh, very massively and uh, 
concretely through our interventions and any of uh, the empowerment and the participation and the involvement of the young people as uh, agents of change is key uh, to achieve the priorities of the agenda 2030. And what we want to do, uh, although uh, that goes without saying, is uh, support the mainstreaming of youth in national policies. So that we go with a lot of uh, activities. Uh, what we want to do is to address uh, the causes of uh, school dropouts. Uh, we want to uh, resolve skill mismatch, lack of opportunities, youth unemployment, and brain drain. Uh, we want to uh, ensure better coordination across policy fields with the involvement of the youth as I was mentioning, and we want to open up and facilitate access to uh, EU programs uh, for also partners, as well to the relevant uh, European networks. And uh, obviously, uh, Erasmus Plus will be very crucial in this context. I think we can move to the next uh, slide, please. Thank you. So uh, very concretely, uh, at this stage, what we can say is that <clears throat> the action points, which will translate into programmers, obviously, will be to help our partners to improve their education system governance. Uh, uh, we will, uh, of course, continue to, uh, uh, to fund, uh, to finance uh, EU programs like uh, Erasmus+. Uh, digital education will be uh, very much uh, high on the agenda. And uh, for instance, it's uh, annual already high. Uh, on the agenda of many of the countries in the region. And in case of Egypt, I could say a few words uh, about that. Um, we would be although very keen to cooperate for uh, the establishment of platform of centers of vocational uh, excellence uh, in the field of the anticipation of skill needs as well. Uh, it goes without saying that the skills uh, for uh, green jobs and green, green economy will be as well uh, uh, very much supported. Uh, and as I was saying before, we will be supporting uh, integrated approaches and the capacities of the relevant ministries uh, to improve access and quality of services to young people um, and net, so not in education, employment and training. If we can move to the next uh, slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so, um, I wanted to be a bit brief on the, the uh, overall orientations because I think that uh, uh, it's simply to have a, an overall picture. And I would wish simply maybe now to refer to examples of programs that uh, we had in Egypt. I had uh, the pleasure to cover this program there. It was in my uh, section. And uh, I can say a few words uh, about Erasmus Plus. TVET and or education programs. Uh, on TVET, uh, Egypt has been uh, active in, uh, in participating in the call for proposals for capacity building in higher education, uh, seven rounds, I think, um, which has resulted, I think, up to 50 projects, uh, which where Egypt was involved. Um, the most active uh, Egyptian higher educations have always been uh, the Alexandra University and Ain Shams University. Uh, there, is a, a, there is a consideration which is uh, well taken on board by the authorities on the need to uh, enlarge the participation to other universities, but at the same time, so building the building transnational uh, uh, capacity is obviously not uh, as easy for uh, universities which are in remote Ghana rights than uh, universities in Alexandria or uh, uh, bigger universities in uh, Cairo. Um, the curriculum development uh, branch of activities has been uh, very much on the focus in the projects in uh, Egypt. And the type of activities which, the type of sectors which have been uh, very much targeted have been agriculture, energy, uh, natural resources, engineering. Obviously, this is not an extensive list, but this is just to say that uh, this is a bit the picture of uh, where the cooperation went. Um, uh, Erasmus Plus uh, has, although, uh, contributed to the transformation to digital education in, in case of Egypt, 
um, there is the there are some projects uh, leading to creation of online open course uh, materials. So uh, COVID had an impact, but it's also uh, true that this was already on the agenda uh, of uh, the Ministry of Education before COVID, and so COVID has in fact uh, accelerated the tendency uh, to go for open course and digital education, even if. I wouldn't say that it's set uh, uh, in proper form, but it's the trend is established. Um, uh, regarding CZ, uh, I would say that uh, the challenge for Egypt is obviously that uh, there are close to 2 million uh, students and 650,000 uh, graduates per year. Uh, so uh, obviously to absorb uh, such a uh, huge, uh, massive number of uh, students is already a challenge per se. And uh, there is the question of the matching of the skills uh, with the demand of the labor market. Uh, EU has been uh, very active in the field of TVET with the Ministry of Education in uh, Egypt. Uh, we had a program which is running for 50 million euros. Um, I would mention the case of vocational training, because I think vocational training is something which is very, working very well in Egypt, in the sense that there are many um, specialized courses uh, for young people uh, for developing their skills for uh, some kind of works where there is a really a demand and which translates uh, very often in a concrete proposal for, uh, 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 for jobs. And it's obviously in the field of the, the touristic, uh, sorry, the tourist, uh, the, 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 the tourism industry, uh, culinary arts, uh, construction, plumbing, uh, electrical, electrical contracting, agriculture, garment making. Uh, Egyptian has uh, also developed a labor market information system, which is a way to uh, analyze the trends in the e Egyptian market. Uh, under the cooperation of various ministries and uh, government entities. Uh, and this is where the difficulty is, by the way, roughly, uh, the, the country is very big, the number of uh, ministries involved, uh, regional centers, uh, industries, interlocutors, uh, representatives from the youth, uh, civil society is extraordinarily uh, large. And so the implementation of TVET, which is very high on the agenda of the country, is a real uh, challenge. But at the same time, it's, uh, I would say, um, uh, positive to see all the effort that the authority put uh, in this sector, which is a very crucial for a country like, uh, like uh, Egypt. And maybe the last point I, want, I would wish to mention is ed ed education programs. Here we have been. <coughs> very active, sorry for my voice, uh, in the context, in fact, of uh, education with a focus on social inclusion. In fact, the labeling of the programs was uh, very much expanding access to education and protection for at-risk children. So we have been working with the UN agencies, uh, UNICEF, uh, welfare program. Uh, we have invested a uh, considerable amount, uh, roughly 90 million euros for two big programs. Um, and they were targeting socially excluded uh, children. And they were all aiming at uh, 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 support child protection. Uh, in those kind of programs, we were supporting the establishment of community schools, enrolling new pupils, upgrading uh, pu uh, public primary schools, uh, and although uh, to, uh, cater to the needs of the children to, with disabilities and uh, the protection of the kids uh, was supported by the establishment of child protection com com committees. Uh, the, community, the community schools are normally very small in a rural array, uh, rural, sorry, in rural, rural areas. Um, the, the instructors are trained by the uh, uh, CSOs, officials of the ministry, and the curriculum is very much uh, with a view to answer the needs of the population and of the kids of the, uh, on the, of the kids uh, on ground. So I would say that these were uh, the three main branches 
uh, for support in the field of education, uh, which I could refer to uh, in the case of uh, Egypt. I think we can move to the next slide, uh, which is basically to thank you for uh, your attention. And uh, I guess I could now leave the floor to my colleague, Mathieu, if that, if that is fine with you. Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead with Mathieu Alderson presentation, and then we will have uh, some space for question and answer. Uh, Mathieu. Are you ready for your? Yes, I'll quickly to change the, the angle of my computer. Hello, everyone. Okay. So, well, thank you, Jean-Marie, um, for uh, your presentation, obviously. And um, let me quickly allow myself to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mathieu Alderson. I'm uh, part of the DG Near A3 unit. We recently had a reorganization, but A3 is a thematical unit, mostly centered on urban capital development. And within that unit, I am uh, the focal point on education and youth. Uh, so it has been quite busy, obviously, but I will be uh, fulfilling this role until the end of next month, uh, because my, my time at DG New will be completed and I will be replaced by Simon Rave. So um, obviously I've been active uh, a, a lot on Erasmus Plus, but I'll come back to this later. Uh, I would like to thank Marcelo uh, for having given us this opportunity to talk to you today. And uh, my presentation would actually try to build upon what Jean-Marie just did. So Jean-Marie gave you a, a broader view of what DG Near is trying to accomplish in the Southern neighborhood. And, um, and I would like to present to you a, a concrete initiative, a concrete project that the commission together with other partners recently uh, led and also concluded in, uh, in uh, one specific country of the South Met, Lebanon. Um, and this project is the diagnosis of the education sector in Lebanon. Um, I will use an abbreviation during this meeting to, to give uh, to when I refer to this project, and I will call it the EDA, which stands for Education Diagnostic Assessment. Uh, the project was uh, run between September of last year until May this year. And there was um, a final presentation event early summer in which uh, the, the, the report at the end of the diagnosis was presented to all relevant stakeholders. Um, I really should mention uh, the, the, the big role of one particular institution in leading this diagnosis, and that is the European Training Foundation. Mm -hmm. I believe you had a, a, a session with them yesterday, and I, if I correctly check the list of participants, Marie d'Orléans and Sabine Nari are there as well. Uh, so I, I really encourage uh, the people here to uh, also include them in your questions. And I um, and also invite Marie and Sabina to uh, maybe uh, uh, expand on my presentation if, uh, if I forget something. But I really hope my presentation is uh, exhaustive enough. So um, how did this project originate? Let's go to the next slide. Um, I think um, this project originates partly out what I would call a certain movement, uh, call it an awakening. But we mostly use the term pivot of the commission towards education. There is an, uh, a certain realization that education should become more important uh, in, our in our policy, but also in our programming. And, um, and this is also what this uh, initiative is actually an example of. On the other hand, you could already argue that uh, Europe has always been very invested in education. Currently, Team Europe, which is um, a term we use to, to refer to the uh, to the mix of both EU institutions as and the member states, well, their bilateral aid to education, well, their official development aid to education already represents over 50% of all grants to education. But uh, there is the political commitment to even increase this further. Uh, this has been voiced by Commissioner Upilainen, who is the Commissioner for International Partnerships. And um, there is the commitment to increase the share of um, within EU development aid to increase the share uh, being spent on education from seven to 10% by the end of the von der Leyen mandate. And, uh, and finally, I think there is also uh, another example to show how education is being, becoming increasingly important is the, the strengthened Erasmus for the next MFF. Um, you also had a meeting with EAC, if I'm correct, so I, I will not dwell too long on this. Um, I have been a, 
a very um, well, I've been very active uh, during my time here at the Denier A3 unit to, to cover the, um, the near perspective in this Erasmus. It has been strengthened, but I will not uh, hide the fact that uh, we from the engineers still believe that we can increase the st strategic aspects of Erasmus. And, and not everything has come true what we proposed, but I hope that throughout the calls, as uh, Erasmus operates by calls every year, we really hope to still improve sustainability improve uh yeah the strategic direction of erasmus plus because we believe that uh, right now certain titles or certain ambitions are not being fulfilled and then maybe i, I just want to refer obviously to the new agenda for the mediterranean that jean marie presented uh which obviously is another example how education is important in the commission perspective and engagement with the wider region so um, I would now to propose um, a, a bit of a deconstruction on the next slide, by the way, um, of the initiative. And um, I would actually do this uh, in a very literal sense because I would like to deconstruct uh, all the different words present in the, the project's title. So first of all, we're talking about a diagnosis. Um, and yeah, this is more, if, if, if you would allow me to use a, a medical analogy, a diagnosis is to look what a patient, what the subject is suffering from and what we should be looking for to, to probably solve it. And, and this comes out of the, the, um, the feeling uh, that programming from the commission and our bilateral dialogue and also our policy should be grounded in facts. It should be grounded in analytical inputs on evidence on the ground. And this is basically what this project has uh, tried to, to achieve. Um, furthermore, the, uh, the analysis, the diagnosis was over the entire education sector. So we did not um, look at a, a particular one. We really tried to have a broad view on this with a particular emphasis on governance and financing aspects. Why these two? Well, because we also, because besides the diagnosis, this um, exercise also provided recommendations. But recommendations will only be transformed in actual policy if you really take into account governance and financing because they are detrimental to an actual implementation. And finally, um, the country where this took place is Lebanon. Um, why specifically this country? Well, because there was a, a certain window of opportunity. Um, this year, 2021, actually marked the end of the, the current Lebanese national education strategy, which was the RACE strategy, which stands for uh, Reaching All Children Who Have Education. And um, the EU is actually looking to, um, to contribute, to, to provide its own input in the development of the next strategy that's being developed. So, um, and we thought that the window of opportunity was there to, to have a concrete diagnosis of the education sector and then to provide recommendations for this new uh, education strategy. Um, I would also uh, actually highlight that this is certainly not a standalone initiative. Uh, we are doing this in other regions as well. Currently, um, a similar project is being run by um, the IIEP, which is a di division of UNESCO in the Western Balkans. And there, we are currently analyzing the education system of six non-EU member states, so six different Balkan states. And uh, uh, this is an ongoing project. So it is clearly to show that we are also doing these diagnoses in other countries. So let us go forward to the um, next slide. Um, a quick overview of who was involved in this project. Well, uh, the four main stakeholders, DG Nier, uh, mainly my unit, which was represented by Fanny Serret. Um, the EU delegation in Lebanon, where Maxence Doblin was the key person. Um, then, obviously, the European Training Foundation, which I already referred to earlier. And obviously, also our Lebanese counterparts, uh, counterparts of the Ministry of Education. And all these three, four stakeholders provided uh, strategic guidance in a, in a steering committee. And um, I would also now really try to insist on what the EDA was trying to achieve. This diagnosis was never a project on its own. It was not holding only the diagnosis. It is a starting point. Um, as I said, the uh, new education strategy of Lebanon was going to be developed. So we really wanted to provide um, evidence and concrete inputs to uh, develop a strategy which actually tackles priorities in the, the Lebanese education sector. And on a second level, we also wanted to make more targeted investments from our side. So it, it would have to contribute to both 
the Lebanese ministry as the European Commission. And at the end of the day, the general objectives were obviously to, to that these that this diagnosis and also these recommendations would help to improve the quality and the relevance of the Lebanese education system. And as I said, specifically in governance and uh, spending. All right, um, before I go to uh, the actual contents of the report, I would like to provide a context, which is on the next slide, because I, I really would like to um, frame the context in which this EDA exercise took place. Um, and I, um, I don't know if there are any Lebanese citizens uh, present in the crowd today or any persons working with Lebanese universities or Lebanese organizations, but um, I would really appreciate your input. input on, um, on the image I'm, 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 I will try to sketch here. Um, Lebanon has been suffering from successive crises over the last couple of years, which are from very different uh, uh, team, well, from different origins. Obviously, you have um, a political instability, which is caused by the very specific constitutional safeguards uh, that uh, Lebanon knows. Um, this is then also followed by um, a demographic crisis caused by the Syrian conflict. As of today, a quarter of the Lebanese population is actually um, consisted of Syrian war refugees, which puts an enormous strain on all sectors of uh, society. And, and then this is also even followed by an economic downturn, an economic crisis, which has not been bettered by neither the COVID-19 crisis, neither by the um, dramatic explosion in the um, Beirut uh, port uh, of last year. So this is the general uh, idea of uh, in which the education sector has to to perform and moreover the the Lebanese education sector has also very specific uh, characteristics and even something what I would call very structural imbalances for instance the Lebanese education sector is heavily fragmented um, you, you can have public schools, you have private schools, you have uh, schools headed by religious groups, which are then countered by schools head, which are non-sectarian. You also have non-for-profit schools, and then you also have elite schools. All these institutions have different goals, different ideologies, but also different means. So, and but between this fragmentation, I should indicate that the biggest uh, the biggest share is represented by the private sector, which has more than half of the Lebanese pupils. However, this means that the public sector, the public education sector is relatively small. However, due to the economic crisis I was referring to, Lebanese parents lost income and they had to move their children from the often more expensive private schools to the public education system, which already increased pressure. This is even further stressed if you take into account that all the refugees which try to access education also have to rely on the public education sector. And this has caused um, enormous stresses on the system. Um, and I can certainly refer to the double shifts that certain personnel have to perform on a, on a weekly basis. Another uh, interesting characteristic is that uh, many schools in Lebanon actually do not own their own buildings. They rely on rented buildings which are uh, which around the third of them are actually not even made schools they are residential buildings which are very ill prepared for teaching purposes and even for pupil safety and this even fur further pressures the government the government budget even more uh, the uh, EDA estimated that around 20 to 22 million dollars is spent every year by the Lebanese government on rent of their uh, institutions and then the final uh, maybe context uh, point I would like to give is the brain drain. The, the youth of Lebanon only have limited, uh, see only limited opportunities, and they often decide to, to move abroad. The, and this even further impacts, obviously, the general level of the economy and the education sector. So, so you can understand that the EDA had to perform in a very difficult basis, but I think they made admirable work, um, which you will find on the, the next slide in which I summarize the key findings. Um, actually, you also have to take into account that obviously because we had to work together with our Lebanese partners, you had to find a certain balance. Um, I take note that um, while this report had to focus on weaknesses, uh, there was also a significant push that we had to highlight certain strengths as well. And so you really see that this EDA exercise is not only about finding uh, the weaknesses, but also on finding recommendations. And um, 
the, so you really see the balance, and I think they, 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 this, that this is really well done by the EDA. I will not, um, in total, the um, EDA team analyzed over 120 documents. They interviewed over 25 persons, and this was even to that was even added around 80 people, which were met in targeted consultations. So um, that was the input they received. And um, the, the key uh, factors, so the key findings, can actually be summarized in three main titles, inequalities, financing, and resilience. I will not go all too much in depth on every single weakness, uh, but uh, I can give you a brief overview. I would then, if you really want to see the, the entire picture, I would uh, uh, refer you to the, um, to the entire study. Um, I'm very much available to, to provide you with uh, the EDA report, but I just need to check if the version I have is actually the one which is allowed to be shared more widely. So I will have to come back on this. But as I said, uh, there are inequalities in access, poor population, also the, the refugees. There is also um, uh, an inequality in outcomes. Only eight, uh, on average, a Lebanese student has 8.7 years of education. Uh, which is actually significantly lower than uh, similar uh, children in neighboring countries. Um, and they also Lebanese students on average score uh, worse grades on international tests such as PISA. Uh, there is also inequality on the labor market because uh, the uh, unemployment uh, degree between uh, people between the range of 20 to 24 year olds is higher than the unemployment unemployment rate from uh, people between 15 and 19 year olds. So this implies actually that people with a higher education and more qualifications actually do not find employment uh, suited to their uh, training. Uh, another main uh, weakness is financing. Uh, as I said, the well, the public resources are limited in Lebanon. Uh, there is an estimation uh, by the uh, OECD, I believe, that. Uh, the ac actual amount being spent on education in Lebanon is not as high as the budget actually envisions to be spent on. More, so this actually leads to an underfinancing uh, under of the public sector. And moreover, um, there is an anom anomaly or a specificity is that public resources are actually also used to finance private institutions. Uh, however, uh, due to uh, these private and public institutions are not being treated the same way. Only the public sector is uh, being uh, is a, a part of the supervision and control mechanisms. And while the private sector actually evades this. So there is also a fragmentation uh, of the financing system. And finally, there is also major issues on resilience, uh, institutional and human capacity. There is also a disconnection between data producers and potential users. This actually means that um, strategies being sent out by the Ministry of Higher Education are actually not being uh, developed with concrete input of the different regions of Lebanon. So there is not a really good sense of what every region needs specifically. And uh, moreover, uh, I should also notice that there are three different education management systems instead of one. So this also increases fragmentation. And the final point that was bring, uh, being brought up by education institutions is the high centralization of the education sector in Lebanon, which often uh, protracts an unnecessarily uh, very simple administrative decisions, which therefore take way too long time. And then we go to the second part of the the, the EDAA report, which obviously holds the recommendations, which you can find on the next slide. Um, these are the more general ones. I will not dwell too long on these, because actually I find that what the EDA report does is that they also go even a step beyond this, uh, and they actually also provide a certain timeline for the recommendations, which are on the next slide. But let me just then say that uh, here, these are just for general recommendations, and you will clearly see that the general recommendations really echo um, what I was um, voicing as what the concrete issues are on the Lebanese education sector. Um, and so let's then go on to the, the actual good, uh, well, the real interesting part of this report is that they actually put their recommendations in two different uh, levels. They, um, the EDA report um, considers that there are short-term interventions to be made, so both by, not only by the EU, by the way, so also by external donors, priority interventions which could have an immediate impact, 
especially in the framework of the um, upcoming uh, five-year uh, Lebanese education strategy. And, um, and then there is also mid to long term initiatives that could be done. And this would require a longer policy debate, with, which would have to involve all relevant actors, which would obviously take some more time, but which should also talk on more sensitive issues. And hopefully, uh, the outcome of these debates would then feed into an, a strategy that even is published beyond the five year timeline. Um, so if you take a look at the priority interventions, I also think that the EDA report does something very brave in a sense is that they make tough choices. They really take a ground and they really take a stance in making priorities and therefore also saying this is a priority and also neglecting maybe, well, making a choice, I mean, on what should really receive priority. And, and they make a very clear call that the first, the attention should go to supporting the public school system, as, as I indicated, the most vulnerable students are situated there, and that this is also the, the part of the education sector which is being heavily stressed. I must note as an addendum that the um, if budget would allow, uh, priorities could also be sent to the free private education, but priority is on the public school system. Moreover, even between the public school system, you have to make choices. And, and there, the report indicates that it is not very recommendable to use traditional indicators such as the divide between rural and urban areas. Why? Because even urban areas, specific urban areas, can be very poor, and rural areas can have different needs. So the, the report in the, uh, advocates to use smart indicators to see which schools need intervention on the first basis. And, and what could be these, um, these smart indicators as well? For instance, the dropout rates, or even the percentage of amount of foreign students in specific schools. And then uh, on a third level, there is also the call that you have to focus on specific immediate impact actions, which can really address the weaknesses that a specific school has. So does a school have limitations on connectivity? Do they need certain curricula immediately? So very, very direct interventions. And then at a, at a more macro level, there should also be immediate uh, discussions on the teacher management framework. So there should be more clarity on their status, on where they are deployed, what their career paths are. And, um, and there should also be more work on the monitoring and evaluation framework. Um, as I said, um, at this moment, uh, right now, the private edu education sector is still is not integrated in the, um, the uh, evaluation mechanisms that the Ministry of Higher Education has, even though they receive funding by the public government. And so even this new framework on monitoring and evaluation should have clear indicators, a transparent governance, which should really focus on reinforcing donor coordination and, uh, and pave the way for a sector-wide vision. And then, as I was saying, then on the longer longer term horizon, a national policy debate, which should focus on the several points I'm, I'm discussing here. So if you would go now to the, the, uh, the next slide, let us recapitulate what the EDA initiative did. On the first level, it provided a very in-depth diagnosis of the national education system of Lebanon. It identified clear obstacles and challenges and uh, where priority areas should be focused on. It will, this will now also allow that EU policy dialogue is actually now really based upon solid evidence. So, so therefore, especially our EU delegation in Beirut will really be able to, to find with their counterparts of the Ministry of Higher Education really talk on the same level. And finally, the report also <laughs> achieved to provide con concrete recommendations uh, in order to strengthen national administration monitoring and evaluation, and which would that really should help implementing the upcoming policies, strategies, and reforms. And then if we go to the next slide, this really echoes the fact, what I was saying, that the EDA is not an end in itself. It shouldn't really now be continued. So uh, the EU is looking forward to see how the five-year education plan is implemented, and also the additional implementation, implementation plan that uh, Lebanon is foreseeing on the SDG4. The EU will continue a strong policy dialogue with Lebanon. We really need to endure, assure that uh, Lebanon keeps uh, endorsing this report. And uh, we should also address uh, ongoing challenges. And I think as a final uh, step that we should also do is that we should also reflect obviously on the challenges that we encountered during this diagnosis process. Um, 
uh, actually in the ongoing analysis that we're doing in the Western Balkans, we are also encountering very specific uh, problems there as well. But uh, this is where I will keep it for today. Um, I look forward to your questions and I repeat once again, I, and I think they also maybe already post uh, some uh, words, but I'm very happy that our colleagues from ETF are there as well. Thank you. Grazie mille, Matteo. Mathieu, thank you very much for your intervention and for this very uh, clear and concrete example of the, the role in a way of the engineer and the other player, of course. And obviously, I invite the colleagues of the European Training Foundation, if they have some additional comments or they would like to underline something, please let us know. And eventually, Ludovica will admit you as a Panelist, and you put that uh, something. I, I have some questions for both of you, but in the meantime, uh, as moderator, I'm obliged to give uh, the right, first of all, to our participants. There are some comments and uh, questions. Uh, in particular, first of all, there is, as you can see in the chat, the comment from the National Erasmus Software from Lebanon, Aref Al Sufi that obviously underlined the importance of uh, the, the fragmentation of the system and uh, the, the, the fact that all the international uh, uh, support, there are no synergies in the country, and this uh, is also a waste, waste of resources. And the other topic is that the report did not mention corruption as one of the main obstacles. Also, other, speak, other participants are asking for the report when it will be available, just a technical information. All the webinars uh, that we realized uh, have been recorded and we will be published in our uh, website jointly with the presentations and in our YouTube channel. And you will receive the information very soon once the, all the webinars will be uh, closed. Um, and also another comment from Aref Sufi uh, about that there is not a national strategy in Lebanon for higher education. Uh, Ludovic, I can't ask you to add Carmo Gomez as panelist in the meantime. Um, do you have any comments, uh, Mathieu, Jean-Marie, so, uh, on the, the comments of Aref Sufi? Well, I, I think that uh, Mr. Al Sufi's uh, questions are mostly related to the uh, the Lebanese uh, example. Um, uh, so to my presentation, obviously, um, quickly because I was reading up on the comments, so uh, giving a presentation and reading the comments at the same time. We try to multitask as much as we can, huh? but uh, we're not uh, we're not superheroes. Okay. Um, no, uh, I think. Um, yeah, we, we, we focus on, on general education, um, and this is what I was referring to, that we really try to have a, a sector-wide approach. Uh, we really didn't try to compare to mentalize um, our analysis, especially because uh, we this report is a, a cooperation between Lebanese partners and European partners um, to provide concrete input to the upcoming Lebanese national education strategy. So if the, and, and this is on how we operated, we, we did not expect that there would be a Lebanese higher education strategy. So if the, it's a national education strategy, the analysis will be more wider. Um, obviously uh, there could be, a, uh, I think the report does make certain, uh, certain examples which are really relevant to higher education. I, I indicated, for instance, the, the, the clear concern that the unemployment rates of people from university graduates is much higher than those from uh, graduates from secondary education so they are it is taken on board but certainly not sector specific and then obviously on um, if uh, corruption is not included i do agree that this is um is not uh included in this report however i cannot uh myself uh provide a concrete explanation on why this was not included or if uh uh, this should be then more discussed by the people who made the analysis. So maybe ETF can add something on it. And if uh, Mr. Gomez wants to be added as a panelist and provides yeah, even uh, more additional explanations to what I gave, uh, I'm, I would be very much willing to, to hear them as well. Okay, I give now the, the floor to Carmo. Carmo, join us and to comment, and then I will make some question on more general dimension. Please, Carmo. Thank you. 
Uh, I hope you can uh, hear me well. Uh, I'm not sure whether you can see me, but I hope you can hear me well. Uh, uh, thank you very much for, for, for this opportunity. I think it's uh, uh, really uh, relevant that we share the, the conclusions and the, and the findings and the recommendations that we have been able to reach with this uh, EDA. Uh, on, on the concrete questions uh, on the report availability and the, if it is possible to share it, uh, our position from the ETF would be that we have this kind of summary report that we used for the presentation in July. So uh, this could be, now it's finalized, it's edited, and this can be shared uh, publicly. So we can see with engineer how we can do it, but it's a short document with the main uh, uh, analysis findings and recommendations. Uh, on, on the comment on the fragmentation about uh, donors' investment, in fact, the report uh, touched upon this issue. This is one of the issues that we have identified as one uh, aspect to improve, in particular through a better donors' coordination and through maybe a more systematic role uh, also of the uh, European Union delegation on the coordination of this uh, uh, kind of uh, policy dialogue with the government institutions and with the other international donors. It's a fact. Uh, it is uh, quite well pointed in the report that uh, there are overlaps in the donors' investment, that there is not a strong uh, dialogue, an institutional dialogue that would prevent that investments are wasted because there are many actors bringing money to the country and somehow uh, not discussing what are the common priorities or the main priorities. And this has uh, resulted exactly on inefficient investments in the education sector. On the corruption uh, topic, uh, 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 we looked at it and um, we looked at it and in the uh, chapter three on governance and resilience, there, there is uh, evidence that supports uh, our, uh, I would say our findings that the corruption is one of the issues that needs to be tackled. Uh, and to do that, there is a need for improving transparency in procedures on financial management, on financial allocation of uh, uh, budget funds, and on the uh, uh, way that these funds are transferred from the central to the local level of, of uh, education authorities. This is something that is touched upon in the report, in particular in chapter three. And I must say that uh, in particular in our uh, consultation meetings, because we have organized more than, uh, um, we have organized a set of consultation meetings with uh, more than 80 uh, uh, participants, even if we, it was during the pandemic times, and the corruption was always a topic that was mentioned. So we could not avoid it to mention it in the report. So it's there. Of course, this is not an analysis of corruption practices or what are the impacts of corruption in the education sector, but it's there. And in particular, there is a clear uh, recommendation for focusing on increasing or improving the transparency in financial management. Um, uh, lastly, on, on, on the higher education, uh, as Matthew rightly said, the report is not about the sector of higher education, but we try to see the connections between general education, vocational education, higher education, and even pre-primary education. Uh, it, 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 it is a rapid education diagnosis. So, uh, of course, we may be criticized because it's an helicopter view of the system, but I think uh, some of the findings and conclusions and recommendations that have uh, been um, uh, just presented, they illustrate how important it might be to have uh, this kind of diagnosis for further policy dialogue between at least the EU institutions and the Lebanese authorities. And of course, we are now working on a methodology uh, to 
consolidate the approach that we have uh, taken in this uh, education diagnosis in Lebanon. Uh, and uh, we are also happy uh, to uh, uh, receive uh, feedback or even further requests that there could be other countries that would be interested on doing uh, something similar. And this is something that we would be uh, welcome to discuss and uh, uh, further uh, reflect. But, so thank you very much. And if there is any other questions, I can, of course, uh, uh, contribute to it. Thank you very much, Carmo, for this very detailed uh, feedback uh, related to the questions and the comments from our participants. I would like now to come back to uh, Mathieu Jean-Marie concerning uh, Starting from this, your presentation, your example of cooperation with the engineer, uh, I would like, first of all, just to mention three UNIMED activities that are in a way probably useful for the work that you are doing. First of all, in this digital dimension, uh, I am very pleased to present this report on paper that is obviously available online, which is this, a report realized by the Uniform Mediterranean, done by UNIMED about the internationalization of the higher education system in the Mediterranean region. We analyzed 10 countries of the Southern Mediterranean region, and our uh, results are more or less in line with what you presented about Lebanon, but we have analysis for every of the Southern Mediterranean, for all the Southern Mediterranean countries. Uh, we have obviously diagnostic analysis. We talk about more in, in detail about mobility, but not only. And we also add uh, an overview, um, very interesting about potential recommendations and roadmap to answer to these recommendations. All this has been done with our members, of course, uh, not only our members, but universities and uh, generally speaking, organizing focus group and meeting interviews and so on. In addition, we uh, last year, we published a report on the Libyan higher education system which was called Libya Restart, again, just on the education system, uh, an analysis of the Libyan universities to try to understand where they are in that situation last year, and now we are going to update this report. And now we are starting a new research activity uh, related to the Syrian universities, independently where they are. Obviously, we are discussing about universities in Syrian territories. I'm pleased to have with us our president, uh, Francisco Matebon, that joined us. Uh, all this uh, research that we did, UFM, UFM report, which is extremely important, there was a six months of work, very heavy, is, I think, a starting point for future initiative, but also the report that we did for Libya, and I hope the report that we will do for uh, Syria and universities, in a way, uh, explain us, uh, I can say, they draft in a way the agenda for future initiatives. You mentioned the capacity building program as a tool to try to improve the education system. We are very familiar with, as UNIMED with all our members with this program. We have, uh, um, I don't know, many projects, but what we see is that there is, uh, there is a lack of coordination, uh, or at least uh, there is no interest or capacity, I don't know, depends by what you think about, to see all these projects from the top and to try to understand what is passing in the region. Uh, there is a lack of cooperation among projects. We try to do our best as network that is very difficult. And I think that using all this report, the report that you presented, the report that we realize as institutional dimension of UNIMED, it could be better to try to have first a coordination among all these projects because with education through Erasmus Plus finance, the EHA obviously around 30 projects per year in the region, which is a large amount of money. And second, why not? directly discussing with you as you did as you did with the, the, the ETF report to try to launch big regional initiative to try to really change or reform or contribute to reform the system. 
I don't know if it's a clear question, but please let me know what do you think about it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, Jean-Marie can start and I'll follow up. Okay, I think there was a point which was on uh, digitalization. I just want to say that this is a very high on the agenda. Uh, I was already explaining that in the case of Egypt, it was even on the agenda before COVID. So, uh, and it's uh, on the agenda of the commission uh, across the board. So I am sure that uh, the move towards uh, digitalization in the education uh, will be uh, very much uh, uh, accompanied uh, through the program that uh, we will uh, implement. And, and as I was saying in Erasmus Plus, we have seen some projects which were concrete in this field. So I would say that uh, there is no doubt that uh, that would be one of the priorities which would be addressed. Uh, in the years to come. Uh, to come back about uh, the lack of cooperation uh, among the projects, yes, it's interesting to hear your point of view because uh, uh, I'm not completely surprised. Uh, I see a tendency from the experience I have seen in the country uh, that I've, I've seen a role, for instance, of the National Erasmus Plus officer to uh, uh, to try to uh, uh, or to say to uh, assist in uh, the shaping of the proposals for the core proposals and to expand the, the, the network of universities uh, uh, by sharing information. Uh, uh, so has to have more uh, uh, more projects involved, uh, but uh, maybe yes, indeed, the question of sustainability and uh, the question of uh, cross uh, fertilizing uh, between the projects uh, would be uh, very important, and so it would involve certainly uh, a dimension that uh, the National Erasmus Plus Office uh, will need to have, and certainly an involvement of the delegation as well. So uh, uh, here. Uh, I, I don't know what will be the starting point, but uh, it will be good that uh, seminars are organized locally in the countries uh, with a view to have exactly uh, precisely this kind of post on the, this kind of post on the agenda. That would be my uh, my uh, suggestion uh, to uh, or, or, or the call for proposals themselves elaborated by uh, EAC should put that uh, specifically on the agenda. Uh, to have uh, to ensure that the fragmentation issue uh, is uh, addressed uh, from the from the uh, from the outset. That's uh, my point of reflection at this stage. Uh, but I think that's uh, certainly a correct assessment of the situation for many countries. Um, yeah, I, I will con continue on this. Um, Look, um, if I, I didn't clearly say it at the beginning of my presentation, I'm currently the focal point for Erasmus Plus within DG NIR. So I try, I am in the institutional negotiations when you, uh, with the AKA, with the DG, uh, DG AAC, and also with INPA, because we, we need to make calls for proposals for the entire world. I would like to be very candid and very transparent, but I do think I also need to respect the internal kitchen of the commission. Um, and um, and therein, actually, currently, my week has been very full of trying to guide the new call for proposals for the CBHE. Um, I think I also highlighted it already at the beginning of our uh, my presentation. We have strengthened Erasmus Plus in certain levels, but from the DG Near side, we think we can make it even more uh, strengthening. And we've been making proposals to the other uh, organizations, which are being discussed, um, in which we really make proposals we think should have an, an added value, such as having a better involvement of EU delegations, which then should engage then with, um, with the NEOs on a, um, a prime, uh, prime reflection before the calls are being eval uh, evaluated by the assessors. Right now, the calls of Erasmus Plus are, uh, are always independent experts which provide a scoring and which are then compared in a final meeting. We believe that there should be a way to influence already, because after the score has been made to, by the individual assessors, it's really difficult to change it because you have to respect legal uh, engagements and uh, you have to ensure a fair treatment of all applications. So we're trying to look into a way how to at least have um, an opinion from the delegations and from the NEOs before these individual assessors start making their scores. However, multiple 
uh, issues can arise. All the DGs need to uh, agree. And obviously, we also have to respect that not all delegations and not all NEOs function at the same level and are as engaged as others. And, um, and this is a, a problem I hope to solve before I leave DG near at the end of next month. But this is also, I'm being very realistic. I hope that we make progress every, maybe a slight progress, but by every call uh, by next year. And to, find, uh, um, to come back on your point of maybe having analyses or initiatives on a, on a regional level, this is what we're doing with the Western Balkans right now. So we are having an education analysis, not this time with the ETF, but with IIEP uh, from UNESCO of Kosovo, Montenegro, Northern Macedonia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Albania, and Serbia. And um, however, there are additional problems, obviously, if you start doing at a regional level, political ones. Uh, I will not make a, I will not make a, 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 I don't need to give more details to understand where, where this is headed. So, but this is where I will uh, stop my contribution. I try to be transparent, but I also need to, to keep the core. Sure, sure, Matteo. Matteo, we don't, we can't forget the, the region where, that we are discussing about and the, the, the political obstacles that we have in front of us. We face all this problem almost daily in our in our network, and we know uh, we know very well. But if we remain at the projects they mentioned, I think that something is doable in terms to improve the impact and the sustainability. I, I, I see in the last uh, in the last year in the last years how the, the national Erasmus officer tried to organizing na national cluster meeting uh, to, to improve the, the, the knowledge of the projects and so on, the visibility in itself. But once you put in a room projects that are working so different topics, at the end of the day, the, the sharing is on the methodology, not on the context in itself, of course. Uh, I think that we need regional cluster meeting on all the projects related, for instance, to employability or to governance or to other issues that in a way they could share also on the contents because at the end of the day we are working on the same priorities, we have more or less the same problems and could be nice that if they, I know that the agency is probably they are not in the position to do that, but probably the commission or why not ourselves, we could organize some regional or pilot initiative uh, to, to try to improve because one project in itself can't change nothing. This is for sure a 1 million project or 800,000 euro now you, uh, this, this new formula, obviously. But all together, we are able to produce some effect in the system and some potential changes. This is the reason why I, I, uh, I think that a reflection on this also made by UNIMED. And I agree with the comment of our colleague from the University of Granada, Arthur Schmidt, to create a community of practice, which is at the end of the day, a sort of cluster meeting uh, involve people who have been active or would like to be active in cooperation through projects and other initiatives. I think that is something that we as UNIMED, we do in practice through the network, but could it be interesting also to, to try to develop some community of practice to share what we are doing in which direction we are trying to go uh, and so on. Um, I don't see there are other comments uh, by uh, uh, yes, by RF and Arthur. Um, I think that just the last comments, uh, my question, and then I leave you because we are small delay uh, with this webinar. I don't want to, to ask you to stay more with us, but uh, we are working to enlarge the UNIMED network also to Western Balkans. We are discussing with several universities in the Balkans. Obviously, thinking that Western Balkans, Western Balkans, independently by neighborhood policy, is Mediterranean, is part of Mediterranean region. Um, we are going to organize several events, at least to know each other, to know the system, because we would like before to include universities to be 
aware about the situation in the, in the Western Balkan countries and so on, but I saw that there is an important Eastern interest coming from uh, those universities. What do you think about to have joint initiative, not only about related to projects, because the moment is cross-regional projects are possible through capacity building. I don't know the new code, but I think that we will continue this opportunity. Uh, do you think that it's doable to imagine to try to influence our education system from one side to another to create some new form of cooperation? Because I know obviously that the university system is totally different. Uh, in Western Balkans, they have many other problems, but different ones. Uh, but do you think that's a sort of cross fertilization between different neighborhood situations could be possible, or we are still aware, still far from this, from this possibility? <laughs> um, well, this is a hypothetical question, obviously. Uh, are we are we far away? I think that if you're talking about cross fertilization, especially from a perspective of civil society or the engagements that you have, um, I cannot find I can find very good reasons why not uh, why to engage. I think there there is uh, there is uh, there are targets to to maintain. Um, from a more institutional point of view, and I think taking into account the challenges we are already discussing of having the problems to coordinate in one region to now also then start to including two regions with each other is maybe walking before we have no it's running before we have learned to walk somewhere so um so this is something actually that from a point of view of the commission i think uh, we should be very careful on this but on the other side what unimet has and and the engagements you can find if you find partners which are uh, at the same level or looking in the same direction as uh, as the the other of your members, I, I think that there are very very valuable uh, gains to be to be had uh, within your circle, obviously. And maybe maybe I would add one element, which is that uh, this uh, cross uh, fertilization and this uh, synergy between the activities of the different uh, uh, of the different universities. Uh, may not be seen as solely exclusively at the level at the macro level of the regions in a country per se. Uh, I mean, uh, there are certainly some needs already to develop synergies between the projects which are implemented there, especially if you consider the agenda on the digitalization for a curriculum development and this kind of uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, then uh, whatever the mandate of the university is, the challenge will remain the same. So uh, that's why I was thinking that uh, a coordination uh, already at the level of the country uh, with the help of uh, the interlocutors uh, we are there, who are there, uh, National Airhouse uh, Space Office, uh, who are doing uh, uh, already a great job there and uh, the delegations could already be helpful. So I will simply say that uh, at regional level, it's indeed a complex a challenge to consider, but at national level, there are already some clusters of synergies which could be explored, presumably. I was muted. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Marie. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mathieu for your participation today and for your uh, speeches, but more uh, for your availability to continue during the question and answer debate. There is, a, I think, a long discussion that we could continue, and I hope that we will continue through email or other means. I hope that we will come back to normality very soon in this autumn. Uh, and now, uh, I thank you very much again for your participation. We are going now to the final uh, session to, with our president and also invite uh, our Secretary General, uh, uh, Professor Hamid Benaziza. If you want to stay with us for the final session, you are more than welcome, but, but if in case you already had a meeting planned, please feel free to, to, to leave the webinar. But if you want to stay, we have just 10 minutes to conclude in a sort of small balance of our webinars and weeks. Uh, I, I give some elements, some numbers before to give the floor 
to uh, to Francisco Matebon and to Hamid uh, Benadiza. Uh, I have some some figures information about the the, the, the Unimed week. Mm -hmm. We realized uh, twelve webinars. Uh, we had more than 200 people registered. Uh, this short list the interest. Then per day the participation obviously was lower. But I think that all, all our members they will uh, have a look to all the webinars that we are we registered and that we are going to publish in our website and our YouTube channel. 58 speakers. But another element very interesting. We have we had people from 44 countries. Uh, attended participating in our unimed week this was for us extremely interesting and important to see that the the, the scope of our events was uh, arrived more than our region not only at the, our 23 countries we had participants also from outside of the mediterranean the euro mediterranean region we had webinars with uh, important institutions like has been mentioned several times, European Training Foundation, the International Association of Universities with uh, uh, an Alain Foundation, with the Erasmus, Erasmus Student Network, and obviously with the Union for the Mediterranean, once we presented the report. Uh, as European Commission, we had uh, webinars with the G-Education to talk about the international dimension of Erasmus+, Plus, but also the Marie Sklodowska Curie actions with the research and innovation uh, to present the new uh, horizon Europe uh, with the Genia today. But also, as I said at the beginning, we had the, this European external action service. And also we organized some webinars in the framework of our sub-networks that are now this year, they moved very well and are day per day organizing new activities and, uh, and this very promising initiative of Unimed. Uh, has been said several times about the report realized by UNIMED on internationalization of their education in the Mediterranean. I think that is a very important document to, that will guide our activity for the coming years, and I hope that we will be able to update this report uh, in the coming years. We have in front of us a new agenda for Mediterranean launched by the uh, European Commission. But I think, as we said several times, and now I give the floor to our Secretary General and then to our President, that we have all together, all UNIMED members and UNIMED partners, to try to define independently by international player, European Commission or other institutions, to try to define our agenda for the Mediterranean generation on how to improve the Mediterranean generation. I think that this UNIMED week, again, online was in a way very tiring and very difficult, not only to organize, but also to, to, for all the participants to attend day per day, but it show us that was, it's still important the role that UNIMED tried to play at least in the region. Let me thank obviously all my colleagues in, in UNIMED that worked with me to prepare uh, all the webinars that we uh, organized, and now we days relax. We will prepare the next activity. Uh, Hamid, the floor is yours, and then we go to our president. Oui, merci, Marcelo. Bonjour à tous. Bonjour, Francisco. Quel bilan faire? D'abord, remercier tous les panélistes pour l'excellent travail et pour leur excellente contribution. Remercier aussi le staff de l'UNIMED qui, dans des circonstances difficiles, a su mettre en place cette deuxième rencontre de Bruxelles à distance. Ces deux ans, nous sommes à la sixième et, vous savez, à distance, il manque toujours quelque chose le contact face to face et surtout l'affectif, le côté affectif que nous portons tous. Un point positif aussi, les thématiques. 
elles ont porté sur l'enseignement supérieur et comment travailler pour l'améliorer en permanence. Et cela est fait à trois. UNIMED, Commission européenne et partenaires. C'est une trilogie qui fonctionne ensemble, qui réfléchit ensemble, qui se projette ensemble. Et euh, c'est une, disons, euh, plus-value dans euh, ce genre de rencontre. Il y a une réflexion sur l'avenir. À partir d'une expérience passée, comment se projeter de l'OTAN et comment faire pour que cette coopération soit toujours au rendez-vous de ses ambitions. Un autre point positif de cette rencontre, c'est l'ouverture, mais cette fois-ci très concrète, de l'UNIMED avec les institutions comme l'UPM, comme Anna Lind, L'UPM, c'est pour, parce que l'UNIMED a contribué, par, a fait une contribution extrêmement importante dans laquelle il fait le diagnostic et les recommandations pour l'amélioration du système d'enseignement dans la Méditerranée. Avec Annaline, ça fait trois ans maintenant que nous travaillons sur le dialogue interculturel qui est une dimension fondamentale de l'UNIMED. Je le rappelle toujours, savoir et valeur sont inséparables. Et nous avons de plus en plus besoin de partager ces valeurs entre nous. Et je me réjouis aujourd'hui que pratiquement ensemble, nous portons les mêmes valeurs pour une meilleure Méditerranée, pour un meilleur vivre ensemble. Et cela s'est vu dans le, la discussion l'autre fois avec euh, la Fondation Anna Lindt, euh, le troisième. C'est une, disons, c'est une valeur qui se maintient et qui se partage de plus en plus. Euh, un autre point qui me semble aussi positif, c'est la réflexion menée hier, par exemple, hein, sur le microcrédit, sur le mécanisme de ce qu'on appelle l'économie sociale et solidaire. Comment, comment développer cette pratique pour tirer le maximum de la pauvreté pour une politique d'inclusion économique. Le microcrédit, c'est une philosophie. Hein, c'est une philosophie. Il y a la voie normale de l'économie. Il y a les options, disons, socialisantes, mais il y a cette économie solidaire. Cette économie solidaire, elle est, disons, diaposant d'une demande sociale et euh, nous pensons hein, et nous pensons que nous pouvons travailler encore davantage pour que cette, cette euh, direction là soit ancrée dans les pratiques euh, des gens le problème de mobilité aussi avant hier hein, avant hier euh, viennent nous rappeler que l'enseignement, que l'université, c'est d'abord un espace ouvert. L'université, ce n'est pas de mur. Hein. L'université, elle est dans l'universel. Elle est dans l'universel, c'est-à-dire elle est dans la mondialité, dans la mondanité, dans le total. Elle est ouverte et c'est, disons, son essence. Elle ne peut pas être entre le mur, entre un muros. Elle est toujours ouverte sur l'extérieur et elle est en contact permanent avec le, euh, disons le, 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 le monde et la société. Aujourd'hui même, hein, aujourd'hui, c'est la session de ce matin, 
elle est positive parce que elle nous rappelle aussi que l'enseignement supérieur n'est pas seul comme élément de formation. Il y a l'école, il y a les lycées, et il y a la formation professionnelle. Il y a l'école, aujourd'hui, rencontre beaucoup de problèmes. Beaucoup de problèmes. Comment faire, par exemple, pour réduire au maximum l'abandon scolaire Je vous donne un chiffre. Chaque année en Tunisie, 100 000 élèves quittent la scolarité, quittent l'école. Si vous faites le compte sur 10 années, nous avons un million d'élèves qui ont quitté le système scolaire. Eh bien, où sont-ils On ne sait pas. Comment les insérer de nouveau Il y a une idée qui s'est mise en place, qui est l'école ouverte, qui reprend ceux qui ont abandonné l'école à un certain âge pour de diverses raisons. Et l'expérience a démarré à Tunis et nous espérons qu'elle euh, s'élargisse à l'intérieur du pays. Vous voyez, l'étude aussi sur la Libye, l'étude projetée sur le système syrien, tout cela montre la connexion de problèmes et la connexion des solutions. Il n'y a pas de solution nationale. Il y a de solutions globales. Je crois que cette session, assue par les différents panels, montrer de la substance pour euh, ce genre de rencontre. Maintenant, à mon avis, ce qui est moins positif, c'est toujours l'allongement dans le temps. C'est pas facile de concentrer l'attention sur deux semaines et surtout avec les alias du, direct, de, du digital, hein, de l'Internet. Peut-être, j'espère revenir à la, à la formule classique du présentiel, mais si d'aventure la formule présentielle n'est pas encore envisageable, il va falloir réduire dans le temps un peu soit-il, euh, euh, cette rencontre euh, euh, avec euh, Bruxelles. Peut-être encore, il faut travailler encore davantage pour la connexion de thèmes. Et j'aurais aimé qu'une thématique générale soit portée par cette rencontre, ce qui euh, euh, boostera un peu plus euh, nos réflexions. Voilà, euh, encore une fois, merci. Et je rappelle aussi toujours, dans merci, il y a une reconnaissance pour l'effort des uns et des autres. Merci pour vos efforts et merci pour vos contributions. Merci à tous nos partenaires qui nous ont soutenus pendant ces deux semaines et qui continuent à nous soutenir pendant des années. Je vous remercie, Mme Marcelo. À vous. Merci beaucoup, Ami, et je vous remercie maintenant à notre président, Francisco. Merci beaucoup. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'll just say a few words to thank everybody uh, for participating in these two weeks. Uh, I want to thank the institution that participated, our panelists and speakers, all the people from the different institutions from those 44 countries Marcello mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, who uh, attended these uh, meetings, our honorary president, Professor Wail Benjaloun, our secretary general, whom we've just uh, listened to, uh, Professor Hamid Benaziza, and of course, all our UNIMED staff for organizing this 
wonderful week. And our uh, the column of Unimed Marcello, whose work is so important for the life of our association. We've seen that this sixth edition of uh, our Unimed Week, uh, so-called Unimed Week in Brussels, uh, we've seen through the, this sixth edition, uh, the organization of different webinars in cooperation with different very important organizations, which proves once again, shows once again, the important role UNIMED can play as a bridge between the, the academic community and the, uh, the Mediterranean academic community and the European institutions, which is essential for the growth of our uh, area. Uh, a new season, a new period of cooperation is awaiting us for the next, in the next few years, we'll have to further strengthen and develop uh, this cooperation. Uh, as our recent reports uh, led by UNIMED and for the uh, Union for the Mediterranean, and the various webinars organized in these weeks uh, represent the basis to strengthen this cooperation and to promote new, uh, very important initiatives. It is now time, and it is time to redefine uh, the political framework for the cooperation, and it is also urgent to do so for the cooperation, the European, uh, Euro-Mediterranean, sorry, university cooperation. The European Commission, as we saw, has proposed a new agenda for the Mediterranean, which paves up the way uh, to this new uh, redefinition. But we think that it is also very important to organize a Euro-Mediterranean conference on higher education and research. We do hope that next time we'll be able to meet in presence, as has already been said by many of our speakers. Professor uh, Benaziza has just repeated it and Marcello too, uh, a few minutes ago. And well, for the moment, we're looking forward to the our General Assembly, uh, which will be held online on the 13th and 14th of December. But we do hope that in 2022, we'll be able to hold uh, our General Assembly and our UNIMED week, as I said, in uh, presence to recover, reestablish that physical contact, which is so important uh, the physical presence and uh, to see people smiling, to see uh, people looking at each other, to, to feel up the presence of other people and hear our voices uh, closer to uh, reality than uh, through these uh, means we have been using over the past two years which have proved very useful anyhow and have helped us carry on with our work. And uh, despite the global tragedy we've been going through. Uh, thank you very much again to everybody. And we do look forward to seeing you in our General Assembly and our next UNIMED week. And of course, in all the different events Unimed organizes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francisco. Thank you very much, Hamid. And obviously, again, thank you very much to all our participants. And we will keep you updated about the results of the Unimed week and uh, the next Unimed activities. I hope to see all of you soon in presence and uh, in your country. Why not? Not only in uh, Unimed uh, events. And uh, I wish you a uh, nice day, a nice continuation.
Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.